Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today, uh, we're very happy to have Simon Mongi to, uh, to give us a lecture on firm and worker dynamics in a frictional labor market. Um, so Simon is an expert on frictions in the labor market, including search frictions and market power. Um, I'm sure uh, he will uh, teach us a lot about uh, firm dynamics in frictional labor markets. Uh, before we start, uh, here's an announcement of uh, about the next uh, lecture. The next lecture will be by Mazana Rostek on decentralized market design, advances and open problems. And it will take place on June the 24th. So if you're interested, uh, please email Bruno or other uh, SEMP organizers. Uh, we'll uh, send you the registration link. Okay, so Simon, I'll give you the floor. Cool, thanks, Jim Thing. Um... Okay, so uh, I'm gonna kind of half do half presentation, half kind of teaching this stuff. Um, and so this is joint with with Adrian, Nick, and and Jean Luca. Um, I'm gonna skip a bunch of things and then do, yeah. Well, let's see. Okay, so you know what reallocation, as we were just discussing before the recording started, like the reallocation of labor across firms, we think is kind of key to understanding a bunch of stuff. So you think of an economy where you've got firms that are heterogeneous in their productivity. What I wanna know is how is employment allocated out across those firms? It's important for understanding what kind of defines in a sense like aggregate productivity, but more workers are highly productive firms are gonna produce more. It's important for thinking about how firms grow. You know, they, if I grow and then you know, half of job flows are coming from, half of hires are coming from uh, 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 hiring from other firms. Then you know I need to understand how labor is reallocated from one firm to another to understand how firms are able to to grow quickly. Think about adjustment after sectoral shocks or the impact of policies. Again, how labor moves across firms in the economy is important to is important to understand. Right. Kind of the summary statistics. You know we can kind of think of reallocation in two ways. And traditionally in the literature, this has been kind of separated out into two pieces. One is how jobs move across firms. So I'm in a firm, so I have 100 jobs, then the firm suddenly has 90 jobs, 10 jobs are destroyed. Or it could be at a firm, and that we can think of as job turnover, and the job destruction rate is around like 4%. Or we can think about work growth flows, so kind of workers move across jobs. So it could be a firm with 100 workers, 10 workers leave the firm, 10 workers join the firm, there's zero job destruction, zero job creation, but we have like a lot of worker turnover. And what we kind of want to do is write down a framework where we can bring these two things together, plus kind of like a classical theory of firm dynamics with entry, exit, firm growth. Right. So I said these kind of two approaches have uh, led to kind of like kind of lead to like separate analysis of labor reallocation. One focus on job turnover, which is kind of the firm dynamics literature, and one on labor reallocation, which you can think of as like the search and matching, also Vene Raban, et cetera, like literature. Right, so this is kind of these 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 two uh, two kind of benchmark frameworks. So the first is firm dynamics with uh, it's like firm dynamics with frictionless labor markets, where there's a dis determinative distribution of firm sizes, which is pinned down by some span of control issues at, at the firm level, or um, or love of variety, like via like kind of monopolistic competition. A key feature of these frameworks is decreasing returns to scale. Right, again by a span of control or downward sloping demand curves that give firms some optimal size. And these have been studied in kind of frictionless settings with no adjustment costs, kind of in a static setting by Lucas and a dynamic setting by Hoppenhain with entry and exit. You know, and then these have been extended into kind of growth models by Lutmer or thinking about trade in, in, in Mellis. Here, the firm size distribution is completely determinate. Job turnover is determined. We've got productivity shocks at the firm level. Some jobs will be destroyed, some jobs will not be. Um, but the worker flows across firms are indeterminate. So you can't kind of talk about that second aspect of, 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 um, of worker reallocation. Um, the second is thinking about worker dynamics and frictional labor markets. And there's been kind of a rich literature and models with, with job ladders, where you know, a key feature of these is, is on the job search, where workers are bouncing around across firms. But in all of these settings, it's been, we've been kind of thinking about one worker, one firm, firm pairs. And this is done because kind of the, the frameworks operate with, with constant returns to scale technologies. I'll show you kind of a limit of what we do with constant returns to scale later on, right? Notable examples being possible for Nero Raban and, and, and Burdette Mortensen. In these models, the firms that size distribution is kind of completely indeterminate or completely pinned down by frictions, right? So kind of like the extreme 
opposite to, to the, the firm dynamics literature. Job turnover is completely determined, but job turnover and, and, and work are turnover exactly the same because you just have these kind of, at the end of the day, they could may as well just be one worker, one firm, firm pairs. And so what we want is something which kind of can link these two, two together. We can think about, you know, the distribution of employment across firms mattering for output because of, kind of decreasing returns to scale, there being a notion of, of, of misallocation but also a model where reallocation across firms is, is kind of realistic in the sense that there's on the job search and, 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 and search frictions. Okay, so we're doing this paper, we kind of, we're gonna provide like a joint theory of firm and worker dynamics in a frictional labor market where we're gonna have Hoppenheim type firms. I'm gonna show you a limit of the model as search frictions go to zero and it's gonna be like exactly uh, Hoppenheim. Firms have decreasing returns to scale, they enter, they receive shocks, they hire and fire workers, they exit. So any data that you want out of a like kind of a Hoppenheim model, you know, we're gonna have that. And then we're gonna have possible vanilla bond type workers where search workers search is gonna be random both off and on the job. Okay, I'm, there's a challenge here to make progress, which is that in this kind of environment, it's hard to think about how value is shared between workers and firms when there's decreasing returns to scale and on the job search. And a lot of the paper and kind of the main proofs are uh, kind of dedicated to showing how under a kind of plausible, I think parsimonious set of assumptions, which I'll mention kind of briefly, we can get like a lot of tractability um, and, and make a bunch of progress. Why is it hard to think about how value share with decreasing returns to scale on the job search? On the job search gives you kind of heterogeneity in the outside options of workers within the firm. So depending on who you've met in the past, right? Because all my workers haven't just come to me from unemployment. They may have bumped into other firms in the past. There's all this heterogeneity in outside options within workers within the firm. So there's all this heterogeneity in values that are attached to like each of the workers. Edward Charles does a job market paper does like a great job of like looking after this in a directed search framework. Here we're doing this in like a, in a, in a random search framework. So there's always heterogeneity in the outside options and with decreasing returns to scale as I hire an additional worker and the marginal contribution of that worker to the firm is, is, is gonna be de declining as I'm hiring additional workers. It's gonna want me to, it's gonna lead me to wanna kind of reshuffle value across workers within the firm. Right, the first worker I hire is, is very valuable to me. And the final worker I hire, my hundredth worker is less valuable. And so at some point, I'm going to want to kind of take some of the value that was promised to the initial worker and use it to hire like a, a, a marginal worker when the firm is larger. And so we can show that under our kind of contract, a proposed set of a contractual environment, we can kind of make headway with this problem. Um, in a longer talk or where I'm not doing so much kind of stuff on the blackboard, um, I'd spend more time on that, but I'm going to kind of leave it mostly that today. Okay, so kind of the first contribution is you propose a contractual environment such that allocations can be characterized. So allocations, the joint distribution of employment and productivity across firms can be characterized kind of very cleanly almost by a single Bellman equation, some entry and exit conditions and some, um, uh, and some boundary conditions. And what I'm gonna do today is kind of show a simple way of deriving that kind of key HJB equation, and then show you kind of how we can get a lot just out of working with that um, one Bellman equation. Um, it's a parsimonious representation in that it depends only on firm productivity, which I'm going to denote Z, and in size, the employment work is N. And it's going to present a job ladder across firms, which is endogenously going to arise on in, in the marginal match surplus of, 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 uh, of workers. In the quantitative section, which I'm probably not going to get to today, we kind of show that that job ladder across firms in terms of marginal match surplus that we get out of the model has nice properties when we go to the data. So in particular, when you look at the data, it looks like job flows across firms are pretty ranked by firm age, but not particularly ranked by like firm size. Um, and if you think that size is perfectly correlated with productivity, then that might be surprising. In our model, young firms are going to be small and highly productive which is gonna have gonna imply they're gonna have a very high marginal match value. Older firms are gonna be larger. It's gonna deliver them a lower match value. And so we're gonna see workers in the model being reallocated from, young firm, from old firms to young firms. We can have firms which are small because they're low productivity um, and, and they're small, or we can have firms that are um, uh, uh, small because they have like a low end and kind of a high productivity. 
And in terms of marginal surplus, they can be kind of equivalently ranked. And that's going to lead to not particularly steep profiles of, of, of reallocation across firms by size, which again is consistent with the data. And so I might try to come back to this at the end. What I'm going to spend most of my time on is kind of characterizing how by starting off at this kind of Bellman equation, entry and exit conditions, we can really tightly characterize firm dynamics, job and worker flows in this, in this setting. Um, I'm not going to talk about wages. The paper doesn't really talk about wages. It's really a theory of allocations. And I can talk about how like extensions could potentially lead you to, to kind of determine wages as well. Um, okay. And then I'll kind of maybe go through the end, how we parameterize the model and then how we apply the model. In the paper, we kind of have three applications. One, which is one, which is how we think about job flows across firms and kind of this, the model's implications for poaching ranks, the, 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 the kind of relative poaching ranks of firms in the data by age and size. We have a second one, which is uh, kind of quantifying the uh, misallocation costs of labor market frictions, which I will go through. And then a third one where we kind of think about the Great Recession, which I think is super interesting, which I, again, I might try to get to. Okay, so um, I'll come back to this maybe at the end. Like, you know, there's a set of questions which I think you can really only think about in an environment with decreasing returns to scale and on the job search. And as an example, which I'll, the one I'll kind of go through later is a simple question like, what are the misallocation costs of labor market frictions? If you don't have, uh, if you have constant returns to scale, then there's, it's hard to kind of put your hands on, 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 on misallocation costs. Um, and without on the job search, it's hard to think about, you know, how frictional labor markets are intermediating labor across firms or, or, or not. And given that that's a large piece of how labor is reallocated in the economy, I kind of think it's key to thinking about questions like this. Um, okay, so let me, like, I'll briefly right, describe- Can I ask the, a question? Yeah. So sure. um, you, you had a, a bullet um, that the notion of firm size in Breda Mortensen is kind of Frictional. I'm wondering, I'm curious to hear your thought on uh, incorporating decreasing return to scale to Bernard Mortensen with some kind of contract posting rather than bargaining. Uh, sounds interesting. Someone should do it. <laughs> um, uh, with contract posting instead of with bargaining. Um, I mean, I like it's still hard to think about Burdett Mortensen as like a theory then of like firm dynamics, right? Which again is kind of here what I want. Um, you know, Burdett Mortensen, you're playing against the stationary distribution all the time, um, and yeah. It, so I think I, I think that's kind of hard to to think about that piece, which is really what we wanted to kind of do in this paper as well. I have like a unified theory of like entry exit, so we can think about all these issues. Um, so I mean. A narrow answer would be, or maybe a broader answer would be, well, it depends what the question is, um, right? Like for us, having a theory of entry, exit, firm growth, firm dynamics is kind of key, intermediated through a frictional labor market to understand how those two objects interact. Um, with Bird at Morton's, then I don't know if you'd be able to kind of do that, um, but maybe. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so. We're going to work in a continuous time environment, which um, makes things very tractable in the following way. Suppose you have a you have a bunch of workers at your firm, and a bunch of different things can happen to all your different workers. Right? They can bump into other firms in the economy. They can become unemployed. Right? If you're working in discrete time, you'd have this kind of horrible problem of you know I have to look after what can happen to worker one, worker two, worker three, worker four, at any given instant. You have all these horrible binomial probabilities. Um, working continuous time, we can kind of think that there's only one thing that's potentially happening to the firm in a given instant. One worker is bumping into one firm. And so working continuous time really helps us out here. Um, Yvonne Werning and uh, Olivier Wang like have a similar thing in their model where they have finitely many firms uh, kind of playing uh, a price setting game with Calver, pri Calver price frictions. If you had like discrete time, then it could be that one firm has the opportunity to change their price, two firms, three firms, it depends on the identity of the firms, et cetera. Working continuous time, there can be only one firm that's potentially changing their price in any instant, right? And this allows us to kind of work on the margin of just, you know, shaving off one kind of in, individual off of the firm. Another thing we're going 
going to do is kind of work with a discrete workforce and then take the limit as the, the size of a worker goes to uh, goes to zero, which then allows us to kind of act both on the margin of time, the only one thing can be happening to one worker at the firm, and then on the margin of like the actual measure of workers as well, right? So continuous time and a continuous workforce allows to kind of write everything in terms of derivatives of values um, uh, over time. Okay, so it's gonna be a unit continuum of infinitely lived workers. The workers are all gonna be homogeneous and extending this to an environment with, the, with worker heterogeneity is something that would be super interesting. They're gonna be risk neutral and discount the, the future at rate row. They're all just gonna be inelastically supplying a unit of labor. There's gonna be some endogenous wage payment when they're employed and some flow value of leisure if they're, if they're unemployed. So the impression should be that this is all super standard, like search and matching literature, go hook, puzzle, vanilla, or bond kind of environment. Um, this is more kind of the, the, the Hoppenheim environment. There's gonna be some endogenous mass M of firms that produce a final good. There's gonna be some entry costs C naught and some scrap value of the firm, which is paid out to the firm's owner. Um, and the production function, which when we go to the data, is gonna have decreasing returns to scale. Right? There's idiosyncratic productivity, which evolves um, according to a random walk. Ends the number of workers, and again we have, you know, kind of crucially, we have like decreasing returns to scale and production, and we also have complementarity between productivity and employment, which are going to be useful later on for describing the properties of of, of, of the model, of the the development equations. Um, how's a firm going to hire workers? It's going to post vacancies at, at it's going to post vacancies D at some cost, right? So. These are kind of the elements of like the Hoppenheim model. There's, there's firms, there's a well-defined notion of a firm boundary due to decreasing returns to scale. Um, and then the other elements are kind of exactly what you'd expect to see out of like a uh, possible and error bond. More kind of standard elements of the search model. Unemployed workers are gonna meet firms at a rate lambda U. Um, this we're gonna write as like F of theta. So some job finding rate, which depends on market tightness. Um, employed workers are also gonna search. Um, with with a with a relative intensity to Z, right? So their job finding rates are going to be Z times F of theta. Um, they're going to lose work. They're going to lose separate into ex exogenously into unemployment rate lambda. And um, from the firm's perspective, when it posts a vacancy, it's going to randomly match with a worker. Um, and I'm going to write this instead of lambda F. I'm going to write it as like Q standards like Q of theta. These matching rates are going to be determined by a constant return scale matching function. So Q of theta from the firm's perspective is gonna be due to like an exogenous shifter in match efficiency and then um, declining in market tightness, declining market tightness theta. I'm gonna shift this guy around later on in order to study the, the limit of the economy as we kind of send matching frictions to, as, as we kind of remove matching frictions, All right? So if I kind of send this to, if I send this to infinity, we're gonna think of that as like a frictionless labor market. I'm going to show you that as we do that, we basically get right back to the Hoppenheim model, right? In the sense that we get like a competitive, uh, we get exactly the same equilibrium conditions that you'd see out of like a competitive equilibrium model, which I think allows us to kind of benchmark our counterfactuals of increasing uh, match efficiency and understanding, you know, it allows us, I think, to make statements about the misallocation costs of labor market frictions, right? Because we know the benchmark when there are no labor market frictions is the competitive model. Um, so Sam, um, yeah, ju just because I have working environments that this doesn't work, uh, do you do you know that it, this actually converts to competitive market? Yes. In the setting converts. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a long proof of it in the paper, and I'll show you computationally as well that uh, it works. Yeah. And like the on-the-job search, what I'm going to try to convince you of later on is that the on-the-job search is like a crucial element of that, right? I'll show you that in an environment without any on-the-job search, you don't get you don't get that convergence to the competitive limit. Um, but in the presence of on-the-job search, which allows for faster and faster reallocation of workers across firms, you then get the kind of the convergence of marginal the kind of key condition of the competitive limit, which is the marginal products of labor are equalized across firms, still with a determinant firm size distribution. Right, so if you're in Burdett Morton's and you take, uh, 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 you eliminate matching frictions, take that limit, then the whole distribution kind of compresses to a point. Right, that's the sense in which the firm size distribution is there only because of the matching frictions. Here, if you take the 
if you take this A to infinity and you remove magic friction, it's still a determinant from size distribution because you're back in Hoppenheim, right? And you have decreasing returns to scale, right? And so we can kind of, the difference between the model that we calibrate to the US economy and this limit is like kind of well-defined. Um, and we can really think of that as thinking about the, 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 the misallocation cost of labor market frictions. Okay, um, so the search effort which goes into the matching function comes from the unemployed workers and it comes from the employed workers. I'm gonna use C to denote the share of unemployed job seekers. Okay, so that's the structure of the environment. It's like standard simple elements from like two different literatures. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna derive a joint value which is going to depend on productivity and size of the firm. Um, and I'm going to show you that all of the allocated decisions, entry, exit, vacancy, the mobility of workers across firms are obtained by kind of studying this object. Um, it's going to be the joint value of the firm, which is the owner of the technology, the guy who sunk the entry cost, and we get the scrap value if they exited, and it's incumbent workers at a particular point in time. Right. The appealing properties of this is going to look like within the co with in, between workers and firms, all decisions are kind of privately efficient, right? There's still potentially like social inefficiency kind of due to standard you know, issues that we'd find in search and matching models, right? Firms that would overpost vacancies um, relative to what a planner would desire. But those also can be inefficiencies, inefficiencies which come from certain firms kind of posting too many vacancies, right? You can get low productivity firms overposting vacancies or high productivity firms underposting vacancies, which leads to a distribution of workers across firms which deviates from what a planner would, would like. We don't analyze the planning solution, the plan solution in the paper, and that would be a super interesting thing to do to kind of get a breakdown of the, the social inefficiency which comes, which, which, which is, uh, uh, inherent kind of like the, the, the equilibrium of the model. Um, but we are saying that still everything is like privately, privately efficient. Um, it delivers a representation which has a parsimonious state space. I just care about productivity and employment, which again is kind of like Edward's job market paper. He ends up with, with the representation where values depend on just employment and productivity. And it's kind of the same state variables as my standard Hoppenheim model. Um, and what we're gonna end up with, I'll show you is an endogenous job ladder in, in marginal surplus, uh, marginal value or marginal surplus, which I'll define in a second. It's so what I'm gonna kind of spend the rest of the time doing is like deriving to an extent um, this representation and then working with it to show you how the model delivers kind of clean results for worker flows, job flows and reallocation across firms, hence reallocation across firms. Okay. Um, we're going to, the kind of the key step in the paper is to deliver this representation by I think a plausible restriction on contracts where those restrictions are the standard set of assumptions imposed in kind of the search and matching literature. So exactly what you'd find in Postel and Urban. Because of decreasing returns to scale on the job search, we have to add some additional assumptions. The main one being that we're going to assume that vacancy posting is privately efficient. And between the workers and firms, we provide a micro foundation for a, a mechanism which would enforce that within the firm. I'm going to kind of skip talking about that. I'm just going to go to deriving this. Uh, right. So the assumptions are like two side limit commitment, renegotiations by mutual consent. Um, we have take it or leave it offers between workers and firms. And we have a standard bargaining protocol where firms are going to make, there's going to be sequential options um, when you have workers meeting. Uh, uh, a firm's vacancy meets when a firm's vacancy meets a, um, a, a employed worker at a competing firm, and we're going to assume that there's in, in terms of internal negotiation between a firm and its incumbents, which is something we have to look after because we have kind of a no notion of a multi-worker firm. We're just going to assume that all renegotiations are zero sum. Right. Um, okay, yeah, I'm going to kind of skip over this. Um, oh, it's kind of a major step in the paper. Um, Okay, so let me derive, I'm just gonna kind of derive from scratch like the joint value representation, which is gonna allow me to just kind of talk through uh, the assumptions of the model. And then we're gonna work with it. So please slow me down if this is like unclear or anything at, at, at any point. Okay, so what I'm gonna write down is the, um, is like the, the, the present discounted value of um, a firm so this is the total joint value of the firm and the workers at the firm 
and it's going to be kind of the incumbent workers at a particular point in time. So I think of this is like the this is like the existing this is like the existing set of matches. It's kind of key. I'm going to work with like a I'm going to kind of think of n as discrete, and then I'm going to take the limit as that goes to zero. I'm going to do it in a bit of a hokey way here, but it's done carefully in the in the in the appendix of the paper. All right. So what's kind of the total value of total value of the firm and and its workers? Um, so wage payments are going to net out because those are payments just from the firms to the workers, and we've got like linear utility. So we're going to have output, which depends on productivity and employment. Um, there's going to be some vacancies. I'm going to get rid of the maximization over vacancies and kind of add it in again later on. Um, but there's some vacancy costs, which depend on the vacancies and the total employment. OK. The first thing that can potentially happen is we can have workers separating into the workers separating into unemployment, right? So I've got n workers, and at any instant, you know, with 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 some intensity, uh, 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 some arrival rate delta, one of those workers can separate into unemployment. And again, this is where the continuous time thing's helping me out, right? I could, if I was in discrete time, I could potentially have one worker separating into employment, two workers, three workers, four workers, right? And I'd have to look after all of those probabilities. In continuous time, is just like one worker could potentially separate into unemployment. Okay, so then what happens to the value of the firm and its incumbent workers? Right, we're going to just think about the changes in values right, as a standard. So I'm just going to subtract off the, the initial value of the worker in, in the firm, the initial total value. Okay, so uh, you know what happens to the total value of the worker and and the, the workers in the firm if one worker leaves? Well, the, the incumbent workers that are in the firm, in the next instant, they're going to find themselves in a firm with n with n minus one workers, right? Because one of those workers is separated off into unemployment. In terms of the incumbent workers, there's also the worker which is headed off into unemployment, and so the value of that is going to be the value of unemployment to that worker. Right? So the total value of the existing map for the the firm and all the existing workers within the firm at kind of the start of the period right, is omega z of n. In the next instant, we'd have n minus one workers. This is the value then of the incumbent workers going into the next instant, and then the value of unemployment, which gets paid out to the, which is is the value to the to the guy who's separating. Okay, so that's what's going on with when workers separate. Um, okay, I'm also going to post some vacancies and at some rate q of theta. They're going to bump into a worker um, with probability phi. That worker is going to be an, un, an unemployed worker. And again, we can think of you know what happens to the value of the uh, of the firm and its workers as we then bump into an unemployed worker. Right. So um, now the the incumbent workers in the firm are going to wake up tomorrow and find themselves in the firm which has n plus one workers. But then they're also going to have to give up some value in order to hire the worker from unemployment. And here, you know, our assumption is that the firm can make take it or leave it offers to workers. And another thing that would be interesting would be to work this all through with kind of a Kahook, Post, Sylvanet, Roban bargaining protocol, where there's kind of some Nash bargaining as well. But here we're assuming kind of the workers have no bargaining power and the firm's making a take it or leave it offer to the worker. So how much does the firm have to offer the worker in order to hire them out of unemployment? They're going to have to give up a value U. In order to hire the worker. Right. So again, we have the incumbents are waking up in a firm with n plus one workers, and they're going to have to hire, give up a value u in order to hire the worker from 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 unemployment. Okay. Um, so that's what happens if one of my vacancies bumps into an unemployed worker. One of my vacancies could also bump into uh, also bump into an employed worker, right? Um, and again, I'm going to have you know subtract off the the value. Okay, so these workers that the that the that the the vacancy bumps into are distributed across all the other firms in the economy, um, and those firms have some have productivities certain them like Z prime and M prime. Okay, um, and so then you know the rate at which it's going to bump into them is like the employment weighted distribution of 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 competitors, right? Because my vacancies are just kind of going out there and randomly bumping into different uh, workers at different firms. The, I'm going to kind of weight the distribution of competitors by 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 their by their employment. Okay, um, again, I'm going to subtract off the the the, the initial value, 
right? And then I'm going to integrate over this because I could bump into workers at all of these uh, competing firms. Okay, so again, kind of what happens to the value of the, the firm and its incumbent workers? Um, so again, the workers in the firm are going to wake up at a firm which has one additional employee. And again, we're going to have to like pay out some value in order to hire that worker from the competing firm. Now we're going to kind of go into the fossil Venero bond sequential options setting. So the firm's going to make an offer. The, the poaching firm's going to make an offer. The incumbent firm's going to make a counter offer. How much is the poaching firm going to have to offer in order to get this worker to, to separate from the, or how much is it going to have to pay this work in order to lead it to separate from its in, incumbent firm? It's going to have to pay whatever the incumbent firm would have, uh, whatever value the incumbent firm would have distributed to that worker in order to keep them. And so that value would be um, the difference in value of that firm if it had the worker minus the value of that firm if it, um, minus the value of that firm if it didn't have the worker, right? So this is kind of the marginal value of the worker that I'm hiring, that the poaching firm is hiring from the, the incumbent firm, right? So the incumbent firm is prepared to shuffle around the value within the firm and offer kind of this difference to the worker in order to get them to stay. And hence the poaching firm is going to have to deliver that value. which is going to have to come out of the value of the incumbent, the firm, the incumbent matches in order to hire, in order to hire that worker. Okay. Um, finally, I can have any of my workers could potentially bump into a, uh, could potentially bump into another firm which they're gonna do at a job finding rate that's kind of moderated by the, the search intensity of, um, of, of employed workers. Um, and again, you know, I'm gonna have this integrated over the distribution of workers of, of, uh, of uh, productivity employment and other firms. This time it's my workers bumping into their vacancies. So this is gonna to have to be weighted by the distribution of vacancies at competing firms. Okay. Um, Again, I'm just going to subtract off the, the, the initial value. Okay, so now what happens? Well, here the firm is going to wake up with uh, one fewer employee, right? Because you know the worker is leaving the match and is going to another firm, right? But that worker is going to get some value. So just like my worker separating to unemployment, again, this is the value of the existing matches within the firm, which at the start of the period includes the worker. It was either potentially separated to unemployment or is going to be separated um, or is going to leave by an E to E quit to another firm in the another firm in the market. Right. So we've got to kind of keep track of you know how much that previously incumbent worker is gonna is gonna be is is gonna be paid. So what's the value which is gonna be delivered to that worker in order for them to get to to leave me? Well, I'm gonna have the, the firm is gonna have to receive a value. It's kind of the opposite, the, the mirror of this. Um, it's kind of my marginal value of, of, of that worker, right? So as in, you know, as in possible Venero, as in possible Venero Ban, this whole term here is going to be equal to zero, right? Exactly because the worker as it's poached by another firm is kind of going to be given them its marginal value at the um, marginal value of the existing firm. Okay. Um, we're then going to have shocks to uh, we're going to have shocks to productivity, which are going to lead to a drift, and then um, our like volatility term. Okay, All right. So we have uh, we have like uh, we have e to u we have e to u layoffs, we have um, u to e hires, we have uh, e to e hires and we have like E to E separations, right? Um, okay. And then I have to tell you about layoffs as well. So this is kind of like a firm which is not laying off any workers. Okay. Any questions about that? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. I'm wondering if there is a case where um, when you poach another worker, uh, the worker is matched with a uh, such a high joint value that the poaching is unsuccessful. So like the EE higher term might be. Ah, good question. Okay, yeah, my bad. Okay, 
So what I should have put in here was a max between this uh, and zero. Okay. So it could be the case that when you bump into the firm, there's no potential you know, to, to, to have like gains from trade from the firm's perspective. Um, right? and, then same, and then same thing here as well. Okay, good question. So I have to kind of handle that. Can I ask something? Um, yeah. Maybe, maybe I'm using, maybe I'm off a little bit, but like this last term that's a zero, right? So if I, if I want to, this sounds like if you're paying whatever, like my reserve, basically you're paying the, the reservation value, right? So it's my reservation yeah. value for the, the additional so the coalition because this is the firm value like it's the joint value but like if you were in actually in a meeting here like design this you wish you would actually put a markup wouldn't you like the expected on, on the value right. of the, of the, the work. work so you right. would ask more as a worker no as the joint so i'm the i'm the we are we are the coalition Okay, someone bump into you and trying to hire you. Yeah. If you if you if I, if we are we are to maximize the joint value. So I, I'm pre I'm prepared to I'm prepared to pay. How much am I prepared to reallocate of resources no, no, within say, the firm to this so, to this worker? And the answer is I'm prepared to reallocate to them my their marginal value, but not any more than that. Yeah. Well. But like I. I your answer is like, why, why can't I then kind of screw oh, over the I, other guys who want to approach this worker? With some probability get a lot, if, if, I, if I offer you, say as a firm, we are going to offer to pay more than actually your marginal value. With right. some probability, uh, the guys will not hire you and we are going to lose. But with some probability, they are going to hire you for more than your marginal value. Do you know what I mean? But they so, don't. But the, here, the worker doesn't have any bargaining power when it's going from one match to another. So, no, and if I, the work, the, the the firm internally is prepared to offer, the firm internally is prepared to deliver this value to the, the marginal worker, and if the competing firm offers epsilon more than that, then it gets to keep. Then it gets to take the worker. So no, but like, that's why it's the worker's decision. It's the worker's decision to leave the firm. That that that's what I. That's what I. I, I think that the. the the words are kind of confuse me. I know I value this value. So say I'm 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 the, the CEO of the, the firm and I maximize the joint surplus. Okay. Yeah. Someone bumped to you and is trying to hire you. I value as as the firm the, the your marginal value. Yeah. That's my value, right? But yeah. like the way I think is like it, it is but the worker this, gets to decide to leave. Yeah. But I, I could, even though I value 10, I could offer you 11. Why? Because there is a chance that the other firm is going to pay 11. Why would they, when they know they can pay 11? When they can pay 10? I mean, whatever said, it was. Because, because I offer you 11, so you only leave for 11. Does it make sense? So you're saying that no. as a firm, I cannot offer I'm you saying like, a marginal I'm saying value. The, the, other, the, other guy values, the other guy values you at 15. And I'm currently paying, and I'm, my value is ten, right? Yeah, but I and so but I, I know that this guy, this guy, like this guy knows if I offer like ten dollars and one cent, then they get the worker. Yeah, so yeah, so like what I'm saying, so oh oh, let, let's talk. What I'm saying is like that's why it depends on the on how this negotiation occurs. So it's kind of like depends on the details. What I'm saying, like, think about uh, an auction. Right. And here we're just saying the right. firms are making, like, take and leave it offers with sequential bargaining. Yeah. So even if, it, yeah. So, but there are two firms. So you think about the work, but there are two firms. So yeah. you, my question is, like, why, why, why so the, the firm worker, the bargaining is between the bargaining is between the workers and the firm. But right? it, so but the, the, that, the firm, there's a worker which is, there's a worker which is receiving offers, mm -hmm. right, from these, from these firms. Well, these and then it gets firms. to decide. Uh, and it gets to decide which firm it's going to go to. So what I'm saying, like you said that like the high firm is going to offer 10 and the firm, what I'm saying is like, it is, it might be optimal for the firm that's trying to retain the worker 
to offer the worker more than its reservation value that's there. But this is what the marginal value, if the, if the firm was prepared to offer more than the worker's marginal value in order to keep the worker, if the worker, if the firm had like a higher marginal value of the, like this is the marginal value of the worker to the firm. Yes. There, it isn't any, it isn't any more than that. It, it, um, the firm might be willing to lose in some states of the world in order to make more an expectation. This are, these are the states of the wor world. I mean, yeah, it's so, so giving I'm, employment. Yeah, so then, then, then what I'm saying is like, what I'm saying is basically, say that he offered this plus absolute, this value, this entire value that's zero right now, because you, you, you get your, you just get zero always. This, if you put, if you, if you offer the worker this plus absolute, this term gets positive. Even though you are losing in, in some states of the world, because you're many we times might have to, have, we might have to come back to this later. Yeah, let's talk. Yeah. I, yeah, I think it's maybe a question about like the precise details of the bargain protocol that maybe we yeah. can like scribble down or something. But yeah, I mean here it's like this is this is like the 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 the, the coalition's value of the worker. It's the maximum that they're prepared to deliver to the worker in order to keep them. The competing firm knows that that's the maximum they're prepared to deliver, and they offer, you know, yeah. exactly so, that. Right? The, and so the worker way. gets that value, right? The value isn't zero to the worker. The worker's value is increasing. We're just kind of saying that we don't need to keep track of that value in order to write down a representation of the total value. So the the, the other the other way to to I think now I understand the the way is like it's not just that the firm has all the bargaining power. The hiring firm has all the bargaining power uh, against the, the the firm that holds the the that has the the, the employee. It, it, it's there's more... no bargaining power between the firms. There's two firms and there's a worker, and they're making offers to the worker. Yeah, let's go back. I'll, 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 yeah, yeah. Let's okay. go back to the Q and A. I... <laughs> okay. No, sure. Okay, so. What I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of take this and, you know, in the paper, we kind of carefully write this down with like a, a delta size of kind of a delta step size of, of, of workers. And then we take the limit as that thing goes to zero. But here I'm going to kind of hand wave my hand wave my way through it. OK, so I'm going to note is that if you kind of take the size of workers to zero, which would be kind of, you know, the questions like what is well, what is one here? Um, then we can kind of combine these terms and write these as you know this is like the negative of like the derivative the the derivative with respect to n of like the total value right okay so we're just kind of shaving off a worker and so what's the infinitesimal what's the change of shaving off kind of like an infinitesimal unit of workers from the firm it's just going to be the derivative of of the total value with respect to employment right and we can kind of apply that you know here and then also kind of throughout the rest of this representation. I'm going to use that to, to rewrite this in a little bit more of a parsimonious way. Okay, so let's do that. So if we we have, again, the total value of the firm, we have, uh, which is the total production minus the vacancy costs, right? Minus, again, we've got N workers, the rate delta, one of them can, can separate, right? And then we have like the marginal change in value of the, the firm, minus the value of unemployment to the worker. So I've just kind of taken the minus sign sign out, right? Okay. Um, if we post the vacancy at rate Q of theta, it bumps into another firm, probably C they're unemployed, right? The value of the firm changes at the margin by hiring an additional worker, right? And then we have to pay the value of unemployment out to the, out to the, to, uh, um, to reallocate the value of unemployment out to the worker, which we're, we're hiring from unemployment. Um, again, this vacancy could bump into a uh, uh, into a worker, another firm. Again, kind of given Jin Cheng's comment before, I'm going to instead I'm going to integrate this from zero to something, which I'll fill in in a second. Right um, here, the change in the value of the firm is, is well, the, the total value of the firm and the incumbent workers. We're adding a worker, so that the margin is going to increase by again the derivative of total value with respect to employment. Right, minus the marginal value of the worker to the competing firm. Right. So this is again what I'm paying out as the competing firm has to shrink from n workers to n minus one workers, and this is the value which is being kind of reallocated to the to the worker which we're poaching from the competing firm. Right. 
And I'm gonna integrate this over uh, the, I'm gonna call this just like the employment weighted distribution. Let this G be the employment weighted distribution of firms over, over, um, over productivity and employment, right? And you see that, you know, this thing is gonna be positive if the marginal value of a worker at the incumbent firm is greater than the marginal value of the worker at the competing firm, right? So I'm just going to integrate this up to, oops, messy. I'm going to integrate this up to the marginal value of the worker at the firm. Okay, that poaching term is zero because the marginal worker is getting paid its marginal value at the incumbent firm from the poaching firm, right? And so we're still going to have these EDE flows. They're just not going to show up in in the in the in the total value of the firm, right? Um, plus, we're going to have the, the terms which are coming from um, uh, uh, the terms which are coming from um, productivity shocks. C and Z plus sigma whoop, Z squared. C. Okay. So already, this is like a lot more parsimonious, and is something that we kind of know how to compute when we put it on the computer, right? We can kind of you. Know, we, this is this is this is something we can operate with. Okay, um, we need to kind of think about what would happen if we were to like. When does the firm want to lay off workers, and when does the firm want to exit? Yeah, Carter. Um, I was just curious. Is it right to say that? So this means that as a worker sitting in this firm, I internalize the fact that I might poach somebody else, but I don't internalize the fact that I could get poached by another firm. The work, the workers' values within the firm. Uh, and we write down the kind of the total value of the firm, which is the value of the workers and the value of the firm, includes all of those poaching terms, okay. um, right? So the workers' value is changing as it's going across these different matches. When we combine the two underneath the kind of our set of assumptions, and all of those terms drop out. So in terms of the total value, which is all I need to keep track of here, as I'll show you, kind of for allocations, um, we kind of don't have to worry about those terms. But those are all showing up in the workers' value. In the workers' value. Yeah, okay. yeah, thank you. Yeah, they're just something that we don't then evaluate. Um, why don't we evaluate them? Because then you'd need to know wages and you would need to pose more assumptions in order to know wages. Um, yes. okay. okay, so you know, when does it make sense for a firm to be posting vacancies here? Well, you know, if this is positive, right? So if the marginal value, if the if the marginal value of a worker to the firm is greater than the value of unemployment. Then it makes sense for me to post be posting vacancies because if I bump into an unemployed worker, then that's going to increase the value of the of, of the firm, right? It's wasteful for the firm to be posting any vacancies if that's not the case. And our assumption on kind of private efficiency essentially means that the firm's not going to be wastefully posting vacancies. Why might they want to wastefully post vacancies? Well, in this setting, I could I could post a vacancy. It could bump into an unemployed worker, and then I could use the fact that that worker is unemployed as a way to kind of threaten workers within the firm that I might want to, that I could, I could lay them off, right? That would be super inefficient because, you know, all you're doing is posting vacancies in order to bump into people to kind of use them as a kludge to renegotiate with, with incumbent workers, right? That incurs costs because these vacancies are costly. So our assumption of private efficiency kind of kills all of that, kills all of that off, right? And hence the firms, the, kind of the coalition is gonna be posting vacancies whenever the marginal value of a worker is greater than the marginal, is greater than the marginal value of, 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 uh, of unemployment. Okay, symmetrically, when does the firm ever wanna separate with workers, right? So I have some employment and productivity is bouncing up and down, All right? So let's think about, um, let's think about separations. Well, you know, what's the value of the firm if we separate with a worker kind of voluntarily well, the firm and the worker are going to wake up with you know one less workers, plus the separated worker is going to have the value of unemployment, right? So as long as that's larger, if that's larger than the value of, kind of sticking together, right, then the firm's going to want to separate with separate with workers, right? Again, kind of taking the limit as workers go to zero, then you know our condition on whether a firm is going to be laying off workers or not. Is going to be whether the marginal value of a match is greater than the value of unemployment, right? I can always lay off workers to unemployment. So if the marginal value of a match goes below the value of unemployment, then I can just separate with workers. In this environment, what happens is I separate with workers. Well, because I've got decreasing returns to scale, 
the value of the, the marginal value of a match is going to increase. Right, so it's going to be kind of a separation frontier. If my productivity falls such that I hit that, I can instantly separate with workers until my marginal value of a worker within the firm is greater than the value of unemployment. Okay. And then to a similar extent, when does the firm want to exit? Well, you know, what's the value if the firm exits? If the firm exits, there's the scrap value, curly theta, it's called the bar theta, right, which goes to the, the owner of the firm plus all the workers in the firm are gonna get the value of unemployment, all right? So the firm is gonna to wanna to exit if this is greater than the total value of operating the firm. And this is gonna give us another condition that the value of the firm has to be greater than or equal to, well, just rearranging this plus N here, right. right? So this gives me like a separation, um, I'm gonna call it like a separation frontier. And this is gonna give me like an exit an exit boundary, right? So if productivity shocks cause the marginal value of a match to fall beneath the value of unemployment, you instantly fire people, which increases the marginal value of matches because of decreasing returns until you're kind of back to this, back to this condition, right? And if at any point in time, which is most of the time, the marginal value of a match is greater than unemployment, then you're gonna be wanting to be posting vacancies, right? So this is kind of quite neat. Like if the marginal value, like firms are hiring workers, and losing workers kind of all the time. If they're hiring workers, then you know they're posting vacancies because the marginal value of a worker is greater than unemployment. At the instant where it falls to the value of unemployment, you just fire workers until you those two are equated. And then you kind of start posting vacancies again. Okay, so now we have a HJB equation for the value of the firm and the incumbent workers when we're interior to this separation frontier and this exit boundary, right? The associated flows of workers implied by this are gonna deliver like the dynamics of employment. And then we have this separation frontier and, 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 and this exit boundary. And essentially I'm just gonna kind of work with these objects. First thing I'm gonna do though, is I'm gonna rewrite this um, a little bit more cleanly instead of writing in terms of, um, of total value. I'm gonna write it in terms of, um, in terms of match surplus. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define like the total surplus of the firm as the total value of the firm minus the value of, un of unemployment to all of the workers within the firm. So this is kind of like the inside value of the, of the combined workers and, 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 uh, and the firm, right? Given this definition, I can rewrite what I had on the previous slide. You know, I'll put all these slides up online afterwards as you know, the present discounted value of the surplus of the match is output net of the flow value of unemployment to all of the workers within the match. The plus of vacancy postings, again, end workers, they can become unemployed. And then we're just gonna have the, the change in the surplus is just gonna be the marginal surplus. So if I were to kind of differentiate this, I'd have, and is you, right? Okay. So I can just write this in terms of marginal surplus, right? Plus V Q theta uh, phi. I bump into an unemployed worker. We get a bump in marginal surplus plus one minus V. I bump into an employed worker and I'm gonna hire them if the, um, N prime D G S N prime. I'm going to hire them if the marginal surplus of the incumbent firm that I'm kind of poaching from is less than my marginal surplus. Okay, it's kind of neat. We can kind of see immediately that you know, kind of a key result of the paper is that we're going to the firm is going to poach. You know, the firm is going to poach from all firms with a marginal surplus which is less than its marginal surplus. Right, so we've got a job ladder, which instead of being ranked on productivity, which I'll show you is the case in the limit as we go to a constant returns to scale model, a constant sales returns to scale version of this model. Um, this ladder would just be ranked in terms of productivity, whereas here it's ranked in terms of marginal surplus, right? So you could be a small, you know, highly productive firm in this economy. Those are gonna be the really high marginal surplus guys. Right, because the decreasing returns to scale is gonna mean that you have a very high marginal product of labor, which is gonna translate into a very high marginal surplus. 
So it's the way if you're a kind of a highly productive firm, but you've grown to be very big because you're old, then your productivity Z might be high, but your marginal surplus might be low, right? Which is then gonna deliver us this result that we get kind of net poaching flows going from large old firms, which could still be high, high Z, to small high margin product firms. Okay. I can kind of rewrite these, uh, the, the, the boundary conditions as this condition on layoffs that the marginal surplus of a match has to be positive. Again, using this expression from before and that the total surplus of a match is greater than or equal to the, the value of the scrap value of the firm. Okay. So I just wanna kind of then use this representation of the, of uh, this, you know, representation of joint value or joint surplus in order to derive kind of, you know, what happens to worker dynamics, what happens to firm dynamics, what happens in the limit as we go to constant returns to scale, what happens as we go in the limit with uh, as frictions go to zero, both in the case of a model without on the job search and with on the job search, right? Which, you know, we can, uh, you know, which are all kind of nested parametrically within our, within our model. Okay, so this is uh, the main, expression for joint uh, surplus. Okay, that was joint surplus. Okay, so I'm gonna do dynamics. Uh, if you can think about dynamics of job flows and worker flows using this representation. Um, I tried to make these curves exactly right. So I tried to sketch them before. So hopefully, uh, hopefully they work out. Okay, so um, here I'm gonna <laughs> confusingly go back to the representation in terms of this total value. Of, of employment and productivity. Okay, so we've got decreasing returns to scale. So this object is increasing and concave, right? And so what's the total value? It's, you know, in terms of whether the firm wants to operate or not, it's the total value minus the, the, the scrap value of the firm. If this object is positive, then the firm wants to operate, right? And if it's negative, the firm wants to shut the, 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 the sorry, I'm just gonna plot this object and then we'll describe when we wanna shut down or not. Okay, so this is, this, is increasing in, this is increasing in concave, right? So, you know, if I didn't have the scrap value, this would just be going through zero because if the firm has zero workers then it's, then it's total value is zero, right? What's, when does the firm wanna operate? The firm wants to operate when this guy, the total value is greater than or equal to the value of unemployment to all the workers in the firm, right? And so we can kind of plot this as, uh, as follows. Whoa, very shaky. But this is number of workers times the value of the value of unemployment. All right. So if this is positive, right, from here, if this gap is positive, then the firm wants to operate. So we can kind of think of there's two kind of exit thresholds. So conditional on size, if you're really, really big, then your marginal product of labor is getting very low, right? As your marginal product of labor is getting very low, then it's better just to separate to all separate all the workers because the average value kind of to the workers is just the value of unemployment. So this kind of gives us one um, uh, kind of uh, exit threshold. Another one is because you can't cover the fixed costs, right? You're just too small. Your scale's too small in order in order to kind of operate. And whoops. And here we have like another an, another exit threshold. Okay. Our second condition that we had was that the, in terms of layoffs, was that the marginal value of a match has to be greater than or equal to the, the value of unemployment, right? If the marginal value of a match was less than the value of unemployment, then it's better for the firm and workers just to separate, deliver that value of unemployment to the, to the incumbent worker, right? So that's a line with exactly the same slope as this value of unemployment. I'm gonna kind of draw it exactly where it's uh, uh, tangent to the, the total value of the firm. Right? And so I'm gonna draw this guy. Um, let's draw this in green, like here. Okay. okay, so at this point, right, the marginal value of a worker is equal to the to value of unemployment, right? This is the line which is like parallel to the, to the red line, right? And this level of employment, um, right, and is like the separation point is that it's going to be the kind of this layoff frontier, right? So to the right in this region here, 
the marginal value of a worker is greater than the equal to the value of unemployment. And this is where the firm's going to be operating, right? If it receives some productivity shocks, which we could think of as moving this blue curve, like up and down, right? And I end up somehow over in the, with a level of employment, which is somehow kind of in this region, then I can just freely separate with workers. I can deliver them all the value of unemployment, right? As, as the firm shrinks, because of decreasing returns to scale, its marginal product of labor increases, its marginal surplus increases, and we'll kind of arrive at this point on this separation frontier, right? So you can kind of think of the value of the firm as being given kind of by this upper, upper envelope, right? It's zero here, where the firm doesn't want to operate at all, right? It then operates, right? And this is kind of the behavior here is determined by that HJB equation that I described before. Right, and then the value of the firm is kind of along here, right? But if I'm here, again, I just instantly separate with workers until the marginal value of a match is equal to the value of unemployment. Okay. This kind of describes, you know, the firm and the, 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 like, you know, the, the I think, describes well like behavior of the firm. If the productivity of the firm were to decline, right, then, you know, the the uh, the this exit threshold would would move to the left. This exit threshold would also move to the left, right? And I'd have to get all my tangents like and my curves perfect, but this layoff frontier would also move to the, would move to the would move to the left, right? The marginal product of labor is going to be equal to the value of unemployment at a higher level of employment, right? If we think about the production function, you know, if productivity falls. And the marginal product of labor is going to be equal to a number, like the value of unemployment, at a at a low at a lower level of employment. Right? So the firm's going to shrink, and the firm shrinking increases the marginal product of labor. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to do is kind of use this figure to now think about segmenting the space. This is like with a fixed level of productivity. I'm going to use this to kind of segment the space of employment and productivity into all the different job flows kind of across across firms. Okay. And then we can move towards really thinking about the firm and worker dynamics that are implied by this, um, implied in this setting, right? So now I'm gonna kind of jump to instead thinking about this in terms of, of, of these expressions in terms of surplus, right? So again, we have like this condition which gives us this layoff condition and this exit condition that the total surplus has to be equal to, uh, has, is to be at least equal to the, to the scrap value of the firm. Right. As I showed you before, right, as we decrease productivity, I argued that the that, that layoff, the, the layoff frontier, kind of the, the 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 level of employment, such that the firm is is going to be lay, of laying off workers is going to be moving to the left. Right. Again, lower productivity, the marginal value of a match is going to be equated to unemployment at a smaller level of a small level of employment. Right. And so the first thing we can do here is kind of draw like this layoff frontier. So this is the line of like Z as a function of N such that the marginal, such that the marginal value of a match is equal to zero, right? And it's increasing itself. We can prove it's like increasing and concave, right? Why is it concave? Again, exactly because decreasing returns, exactly because decreasing returns to scale, okay? So this is this layoff frontier. So I know that if you know, my employment is kind of too high in a sense, Suppose I had a jump process for productivity and the firm was here and then productivity just suddenly fell and I found myself to the right of this layoff frontier. I know that in this region, I'm kind of too big. The marginal value of a match is less than the value of unemployment. And so then I'm just gonna fire workers, which increases my marginal value until I get to the point where the marginal value is equal to the value of unemployment. So this is going to be an area where, which is defined by kind of job destruction, right? where 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 you know workers are just going to be like immediately immediately separated from the firm. Okay, so that's the first one. The second thing we can draw is kind of this is this is this exit frontier. It's also drawn in blue, right? As I described before, as productivity falls, we're going to see those exit boundaries kind of move in from either side, right? And as productivity continues to fall, kind of think about this figure. As productivity continues to fall, at some point, well, at some point, you know, the firm's just not going to want to operate at all, right? At any level of employment, the value of the total value is uh, um, 
net of the fixed cost is less than or equal to the value of unemployment to all workers, right? So we can go and think of this fixed, this, this, uh, this second condition is like drawing this uh, exit boundary through employment and productivity space, right? If you think through that, the other figure is employment falls, right? These, these two boundaries are moving in from the left and the right, right? Because the marginal product of matches is falling on the right and because you know, the total value is, is kind of less than the fixed cost on the left, right? At some point, the curve I drew in blue from before kind of kisses the, 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 uh, the, um, uh, the value of unemployment kind of line, right? At which point, right, the marginal surplus of a match is exactly equal um, at which point these two do these two lines intersect kind of at their lowest point. Okay, so this is the line in which the total value is equal to this, the total surplus is equal to the scrap value. Okay. Okay, so in this space, kind of in here, the firm is going to be operating. If for some reason the firm were to find itself outside of this space, then the firm is gonna is gonna exit. All right, but we can kind of do a little bit better in terms of describing the, the, the dynamics of the firm. Okay, so first imagine that like the, the firm is on this layoff frontier, but then suppose it had just like a slightly higher level of productivity, right? In this case, the marginal surplus is greater, is positive. The firm's gonna start posting vacancies, right? The firm starts posting vacancies. We know if it bumps into an unemployed work, it's gonna hire them because the marginal surplus is positive, right? The marginal value of a match is greater than the value of unemployment. And it's also going to be kind of right at the bottom of this ladder in terms of marginal surplus, right? So it's just started kind of laying off work. It's going to be, uh, um, sorry, it's, yeah, it's right at the, at the bottom of the ladder in terms of marginal surplus. And so it's going to be losing workers to, 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 it's going to be losing workers to other firms, right? And this is going to lead the firm to kind of shrink, right? So it's still going to be hiring from unemployment, but because it's right at the bottom of the marginal surplus ladder, it's going to be losing a lot of its workers to competitors. As it loses a lot of workers to its competitors, it's then going to shrink. And I'll show you in the next slide as it shrinks, it then starts kind of posting more vacancies. But here the firms can be shrinking. And think about like keeping productivity fixed. Right. If I go kind of over here, here relative productivity, the firm is very small and its marginal surplus is going to be very, very high, right? As marginal surplus is very high, it's going to be posting lots of vacancies because the marginal value is, is high, right? And because this marginal surplus is high, it's right at the top of this surplus ladder. So any worker that it bumps into at another firm, it's gonna hire. And as it does so, it's gonna grow. Right? In between these two, we're gonna get kind of a curve where the size of the, 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 where the, the size of the firm kind of is, oops, get rid of this stuff first. Bump, 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 bump. Right. We can get this locus along which the size of the firm is, is, is kind of constant, right? Which is strictly to the left of this, this, uh, this layoff frontier and this, this exit boundary, okay? So to the right, firms are shrinking, right? They're kind of very big. They have a low marginal surplus. They are posting vacancies. They are hiring workers from unemployment, right? So we have exactly this kind of what I wanted in the motivation. I've got workers, firms that are posting vacancies. They're hiring from unemployment, but on net, they're losing workers and they're losing workers to other firms because they're right at the bottom of this ladder in terms of marginal surplus. To the right, they're posting lots of vacancies. They're right at the top of the ladder and they're hiring lots of workers from competing firms. Right? They're also hiring, losing some workers to firms which are beneath them on the ladder as well. Right? So in this case, we have you know, EE, uh, EE quits. are gonna be greater than hires from competitors. And here, EE hires are going to be greater than and uh, quits the competitors, right? And both of them are still going to be hiring workers from unemployment. Firms over here have a high marginal surplus. They have lots of vacancies. Here they have a small marginal surplus. They have like a few vacancies. Okay. So firms to the right of this line are drifting to the left. Firms to the left of this line are drifting, are drifting, are drifting to the right. Okay. We still haven't said kind of where firms are going to exit. So then we also kind of have an additional condition which we can bring in, which is like a smooth pacing condition. At the, at the at, if a firm is exiting optimally, 
then it must be the case that the marginal value of a, that the marginal surplus is, is zero, right? Why? Well, if the firm was exiting and the marginal value was positive, then it could be posting vacancies and hiring workers. Right? We know that along this curve, the marginal value of a match is zero. And we can prove that marginal surplus is concave, right? So all this, although this curve here defines kind of a set along a set of points along which the total surplus is equal to this, this scrap value, we also know that firms can't be exiting along this boundary, right? Because along this boundary, we know that the marginal surplus of a match is the marginal surplus of a match is positive, right? Which would violate the firm exiting optimally. And that kind of makes sense as well, because to the right of this line, firms are drifting to the right. You know? So if you get a productivity shock, right, you then quickly post more vacancies and drift to the right away from this, or away from this exit boundary. Right? So we know that firms aren't going to be kind of located right along this, uh, right along this boundary. Um, turns out when you stick it in a computer, you get exactly that. Right? So there's kind of no mass right along this, right along this strip. Okay. Consider a firm here. Well, this firm would be drifting to the left. And we'd be heading towards exiting with a marginal surplus, which is positive. Right? So this is out of bounds. Right? Can't be that firms are located here because they're drifting towards exiting with a positive marginal value. Right? So what that leads us to conclude is that the exit boundary actually looks like this flat curve here. Right? This kind of then defines a set of points along which, you know. Exit is optimal, and this hamilton jacobi Feldman equation holds in the holds in the interior, right? So what we end up with is firms kind of located, you know, interior to this boundary, and then exiting exiting along here, and separating with workers along here. Right? So if you think about a firm, it gets some productivity shocks, right? Kind of hits this layoff boundary. It gets further productivity shocks. It separates with workers until the marginal value of a match is equal to the value of unemployment, right? If it gets further productivity shocks, it's going to lay off more and more and more workers, and then it's going to exit. If we have a firm here, it's you know low on the surplus ladder. It's drifting to the left, right? It's unemployment. It's employment potentially drifting downwards, right? And at some point, it's going to uh, some way we could potentially optimally exit. Okay. So we get exit along here, we get layoffs along here. In this region, we get uh, job destruction. The firm is shrinking on that. In this region, we get job creation. And in both of these regions, we get positive EDE hires and EDE quits. Right. You think it's like a relatively complete characterization of the, of the employment dynamics of firms. Okay. Um, we can kind of then decompose this, what I kind of described, I described that just before into the employment flows and how these break down into E or higher in, into these different flows across firms, right? But we kind of have like what we want, right? We have productivity shocks creating job creation, job destruction. We have endogenous layoffs of workers into unemployment. We have firms exiting. If you think about when firms enter, um, it's gonna make this even messier, right? When firms enter, we're going to give them like some ma some massive employment, which is hired outside of the matching function, just to start them off, right? And so you can imagine firms being firms entering and drawing some initial productivity, and being located kind of along this strip here, where this is in north, right? So in terms of the life cycle dynamics of firms, young firms are going to be initially small. Because they're small, they're going to have high marginal surpluses. They're going to be posting lots of vacancies, and then they're going to be drifting to the right. So this thing gives us kind of a theory of firm growth, right? There's still productivity shocks, which are going to lead to, you know, lots of heterogeneity in terms of their outcomes. Some firms might end up exiting, right? But on average, these firms are going to grow, and they're going to do it mostly through poaching, right? Mostly through E to E hires, and they're going to have very few E to E quits. Why? Because they're small and they have a very high marginal surplus. Okay. And we can kind of decompose these flows. So what I wanna do in the next, in the last like 12 minutes is go through kind of two limiting cases of this economy. Um, a constant returns to scale economy 
and then uh, a frictionless economy. Um, let me do the frictionless one first, because I think that's kind of more interesting in thinking about exactly what we're kind of set out to think about, which is uh, 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 misallocation. Um, okay, so you know we have our economy and we have our matching function, right, which delivers us a uh, uh, a meeting rate of workers with firms, which now I'm going to kind of um, I'm going to uh, write like this. Okay, so our matching function delivers us this, this rate at which firms bump into vacancies. Um, and what do we want to do is think about what happens as this goes to infinity, right? So matching becomes highly efficient. Okay. What I want to first think our kind of our main result is going to be as the frictions disappear, A goes to infinity, the distribution of firms in the economy is going to kind of converge to a strip along which the marginal product of labor at all firms is exactly equal to the, the value of the, the flow value of unemployment. Marginal products being equated across firms is exactly kind of the hallmark of like the competitive allocation um, that you get out of a Hoppenheim model. And here we're gonna have an entry condition as well and an exit condition, which also looks exactly the same as kind of like the Hoppenheim model. And that's the sense in which away from that limit where A is not infinity, we can kind of think of the economy that comparative static of increasing A is measuring the misallocation costs of labor market frictions. Okay, before doing that though, I wanna kind of, sh to get at the role of on the job search in this process of kind of, of, of uh, the frictionless economy delivering um, uh, the competitive limit, I wanna focus on instead an economy without on the job search, right? So this is our, uh, HJB equation before for surplus, but now I just want to turn um, I just want to turn off on the job search, right? So I'm just going to kind of get rid of this old term here. In our model, we can do this just by setting you know it's nested as a parametric restriction in the model, which is just setting the search efficiency of workers on the job to zero. Okay, so this is our HJB equation, and let's just erase the piece which is coming from on the job search, right? Uh, right, and, 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 and we get this, right? And we still have, we still have decreasing returns to scale, right? So we have this condition and we have an entry condition, which is that the cost of entry has to be equal to the expected surplus, where I'm gonna kind of integrate this over the exogenous distribution of, of, uh, of, um, of initial productivity. Okay. So, you know, let's, write this Q more carefully as depending on um, as depending on this match efficiency and, and the market tightness A and theta. Okay. Now let's think about the comparative static as we like increase A for, to A prime, which is greater than A. Okay. The Hoppenheim logic of what happens here is super, super strong, right? And this is something I was taught in grad school by Gianluca, but I never, I slowly, I'm slowly still understanding like in practice, right? But the logic is the following. Take a Hoppenheim model. What's that? It's a, you know, well, it's an environment, right? But the key objects that you get out of it are a Bellman equation, right? For some value. And, you know, you get a, and you have, and you have a free entry condition. And there's like an exit condition as well, right? But I'm not even, I don't even need to deal with that for, 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 for this proof, right? Suppose you consider a comparative static of that economy with respect to some parameter which does not show up directly in the Bellman equation. What are the implications for like firm dynamics? And the answer is like zero, right? And the reason is the following. Suppose I take this economy with some parameter A and I solve this economy, right? Now, I have this Bellman equation and I have a free entry condition. Okay. I have an equilibrium object. And I should modify my claim by the fact you've got like one equilibrium price in your Bellman equation. But I've got one equilibrium object in my Bellman equation, Q, right? So I get some Q star as a function of A and I get some equilibrium level of market tightness, theta star, right? 
Now suppose I have a comparative static with respect to A. I increase A to A prime. And I go, well, what's the effect on Q? The answer has to be nothing, right? Because there was one Q which satisfied the Bellman equation in the free entry condition before, right? That A doesn't show up anywhere in either of those conditions. Therefore, it has to be that the same Q holds. Right? So I increase A from to A prime greater than A. My claim is that you know you basically get the same Q star, right? A prime theta prime. Oops. Equals Q star A of theta. So what happens? How does the Hoppenheim kind of logic work? Right. Well, I've increased match efficiency. Suppose I kept market tightness fixed, right? Then Q would increase. Right? Firms are going to be bumping into unemployed workers more, more quickly. The value of firms is going to increase. The first order, the, the entry condition is then going to be violated. I've got an infinite mass of potential entrants. They're not going to enter. And as they enter, vacancies are going to increase, and they're going to increase such that market tightness increases. And that brings Q back down to exactly the same level of Q as it was before. So this logic is like super strong in like a Oppenheim model. Oppenheim and co-authors recently have like a paper which is I think for common econometrica and Fatih Karahan and co-authors have another paper where both of them really leverage this, right? They consider the effect of a parameter which in both of those cases is like the amount of workers in the economy or you know something which is happening say preferences or supply and demand which is outside of these kind of two equations in their models, right? And then you go, well, you know, what would be the, what's the effect of that on the wage, where the wage is the only equilibrium price in those Bellman equations? And the answer is like zero, right? Because again, free entry means that there is only one unique value of this kind of price, which satisfies jointly the Bellman equation and the free entry condition. Okay. okay, so now what else do I know? So I increase A prime and I increase it to A and Q remains the same because of the free entry condition. There's a unique value of Q that satisfies these two. So then what happens to firm dynamics? Well, Q is the same, right? Q is the same. So give me a level of employment and productivity. The decision rules in terms of vacancies are the same. Q is the same. All the dynamics are exactly the same, right? So if you were to think about like a time series, of this, if you think about this model over time, we're not doing the transition here, but if you think about this over time, which is what those guys do in their other papers, right? You have some change to a parameter, the Bellman equation stays exactly the same. What changes though is the, me is the measure of entry, right? And then some endogenous object M, right? And so that's gonna have compositional effects on the distribution of firms, right? So if entry falls, for example, the average age of firms is gonna increase. The conditional in any cohort, the conditional distribution of say employment and productivity is exactly the same. Right? So as I in, in a model without on the job search, as I increase productivity, I know that there's a unique Q. I know that the firm dynamics are the same. The only thing that changes the measure of firms. So if I have some distribution of firms over Z and N, and therefore some distribution of, let's call it G of marginal surplus, underneath a particular value of A, then I know that it's the same distribution under a comparative static value of A, right? As I move A to infinity, right? Q stays the same, and I just get more and more and more and more firms and the same cross-sectional distribution of, of marginal surplus, right? And the distribution of marginal products, you know, the marginal product of labor here, alpha Z N to the alpha minus one, the distribution of this object is gonna be the same as well. So in an environment without on the job search in this limit, the distribution of marginal products is exactly the same, right? In particular, they are not gonna be equal to the marginal product. They're not gonna be kind of, they're not gonna be equated across firms, which we know is kind of the, like, you know, makes sense to be the competitive limit. What happens if I have on the job search, right? Well, we have other, we have, simply put, we have other equilibrium objects in our Bellman equation, which can move around, right? In fact, we have the whole distribution of surpluses. I'm gonna kind of go through the, the, the whole proof here. But like, imagine what's happening is you're increasing uh, efficiency in the, in, the, in, the, in, in the labor market. I have some 
firm, uh, I have some firm with some marginal surplus in C, and I have some other firm with a lower level of marginal surplus. As we increase the efficiency of meetings in the labor market, these two firms are going to be bumping into each other. You know, there's a higher probability these two firms bump into each other. What happens as they bump into each other is employment is workers are traded from the low marginal surplus firm to the high marginal surplus firm. As that happens, because of decreasing returns, the marginal surplus of the high productivity firm falls and the marginal surplus of the low productivity firm increases. As this happens faster and faster and faster, this distribution of marginal surplus is going to collapse. In the limit, if I get a productivity shock and I want to hire an efficient worker, I post some vacancies and I immediately hire them away from workers with lower levels of marginal surplus. And what we establish in the paper is that um, uh, the equilibrium can then be characterized as, 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 as follows. You end up with the, the, the um, you go, this is like right, it's the papers. Um, You end up with like the following Dalman equation, where let me move all this stuff through here. As opposed to posing vacancies, I can basically just choose my size, right? Because I post some vacancies, I immediately fill them with workers from other firms who have some small deviation in marginal surplus away from me, right? So I can think of them as just choosing their size to maximize their output. Again, in the limit kind of, you know, and in the limit, this whole entire term is gonna disappear because the distribution of marginal surplus through this interaction through on the job search is gonna to shrink to a point. Z S Z and C plus sigma Z. C, right? Hmm. I should remove the ends from these, right? So in the limit, right, without any frictions and via on the job search, it's as if a firm can just choose its optimal size and kind of prove that in the limit, the Bellman equation is, is, is this one, right? What's the optimality condition here? It's just exactly the static one. So the marginal product of labor at all firms is just equal to the flow value of unemployment to workers. So in the limit, via on the job search, all the marginal product of marginal products of labor across firms are equalized, right? Because trading workers across firms collapses the distribution of marginal surpluses to a point. Right? The entry condition is that C naught is S C D F C, and the exit condition is that this is greater than um, bar phi. And so you kind of stare at this set of conditions. And you go, aha, this is like exactly the same set of conditions as in like Hoppenheim's paper, right? So the limit via on the job search as, 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 as frictions in the labor market go to zero gives you exactly the kind of standard competitive benchmark model of firm dynamics. We think this is nice because kind of it means that away from this limit or the gap between these two is some measure of the efficient, the misallocation costs of, of search frictions. If there isn't infinitely fast reallocation of labor across firms, and there is dispersion in marginal surpluses, and the dispersion in marginal surpluses reflects dispersion in marginal products, which reflects a deviation away from like the competitive limit. Right? And you can kind of see this as we look at the life cycle dynamics of firms. I'll do this in one more slide and then you can close. All right, so this is the distribution of, of, of workers over employment and productivity as firms age in the model. Right? So firms start off small. With relatively low productivity, productivity can, can extend upwards, drift upwards due to positive productivity shocks, right? And as we, as the firms age, we kind of see this like blob elongate along, uh, uh, kind of along the, along the, uh, um, along the diagonal, right? If employment, if, if we had the, if the marginal product of labor across all firms was equated, then this would just line up along a strip. Log n is just linear, log z is just linear with respect to, log n is just linear with respect to log z, 
right? So the deviations from this strip are exactly telling us about like the misallocation effects of labor market frictions. And our mind determines about misallocation plus the labor market frictions, right? And you kind of see that flat exit region that I drew before in that previous figure, and then the layoff frontier as well, right? Where again, no firms are then exiting, exiting to the, uh, exiting to the left. I believe this is kind of lagging, okay? So over time, firms are becoming more productive. The marginal surplus of labor is getting equated through the, the trading of workers, okay? What we then do is a comparative static. And I think my, my thing is my iPad's lagging. We then do a comparative static where we, you know, now that we've benchmarked this, I think I can theoretically, we then do a comparative static where we increase match efficiency. As we increase match efficiency, the non-employment rate in the model uh, declines, right? And because of the increased rate at which workers are bumping into other firms on the job, the standard deviation of the marginal product of labor compresses across firms, right? Which is exactly kind of our theoretical limit. As that happens, Labor is being more quickly reallocated up the uh, uh, up the marginal surplus ladder. Then the correlation between size and productivity, the correlation between size and productivity increases. Right? As the correlation between size and productivity increases, then TFP in the economy increases. Right? Because conditional on a mass of labor, we're allocating it to more productive firms. So output increases due to two things. One, well, you know. We have less search friction, so there's less in, there's more employment in the labor market. There's just more bodies working. That's going to increase output. But then the better reallocation, the better allocation of workers across firms is also increasing TFP. And we find that these are roughly kind of half-half, right? Or kind of a third, two-thirds. The increase in TFP due to the declining um, uh, search frictions is responsible for about a third of the increase in, in TFP in, in output. Right, so the misallocation effects of search frictions we kind of quantify as being sizable. Okay, uh, we do a bunch of quantitative stuff where we, you know, compare the models implications of poaching rates across firms and we uh, implications of that relative to the data, and we do our great recession experiment. So I'll end there. So it's a framework to study firm worker dynamics of frictions where we kind of really ensure how labor market frictions impede reallocation of labor across firms. In particular way, right? In terms of the the you know again in the limit, this reallocation is super fast, and that leads to a competitive distribution of uh, marginal products of labor being equated across firms. Um, our assumptions lead to like a low dimensional state space of productivity and size, and endogenous job bladder and marginal surplus. And we think hope this can be applied to a number of macro labor and trade questions. In in a NBR working paper, which is like forthcoming in a, a conference volume. Um, you know, we extend the model to allow for endogenous growth, and we show that kind of a growth slowdown due to decline in rates of kind of imitation leads to patterns that we've observed in the U.S. economy over time: less labor market flows, less entry, less exit, lower EE rates, lower responsiveness of firms to shocks, um, uh, and kind of other empirical objects. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Simon. Uh, this was really good. Thanks for the extra time. Uh, I really appreciate that. No um, worries. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to run. I'm gonna have to run off, unfortunately, yeah. though. I know, I know, I know. Uh, but uh, yeah, thank you very much. And we are gonna post this uh, on YouTube soon, and we'll all get uh, an email. Right, yeah. and I'll um, I'll send you the scribbled slides. Maybe okay. I'll tidy them up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Take your time, and we'll post on our website. Cool. Thanks, guys. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.